Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to have you here this morning. Good to see you all. Let's begin, shall we, with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, in the biblical record of your short stay on planet Earth, you have given us a wonderful example of single-mindedness, single-minded love and devotion to our Father in heaven. We can readily see how far we fall short of this model. So please forgive our failures and enable us to make the right choices. Be with us here today in our study that we might continue to grow in your word and in knowledge and in wisdom and make it applicable to our lives. Thank you for your love and forgiveness in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay. We are going into chapter 4, so if you have your Bibles with you, please open them to chapter 4. While you're doing that, I'm going to just share with you the cartoon for the week. Okay. This way I don't have to keep updating the sign. It says, regular appalling plus unleaded, obscene, supreme, and let it holy walk a holy. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that or not. Here's another one just in case that one doesn't sink in. Oh. And if you disagree with that cartoon, talk to me after service. <laughs> 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 Because that, you were where you were. That says just, it all. Saying, oh, all right, we are in chapter four. And we're going to take a look at the first section before we do that. In this particular chapter, I've been taking the bigger chunks. And this one, I'm going to take it in smaller. We're going to just do a few verses at a time, actually, working our way through this. And I'm going to do the overview here for you, first of all. The, the kind of the theme for this whole chapter, I think, is the godly life clashes with worldliness. That's what James is going to talk about here. The godly life clashing with worldliness. <clears throat> for quite some time prior to the end of 1992, the media of our country reported regularly about the plight of millions of people in the African country of Somalia. Photographs and videotapes of starving men and women, and especially those of little children and babies, were heart-wrenching. And you'll re if you've been around for a while, you'll remember some of these photos. What tore at our heartstrings especially was the information that there wasn't a lack of food in Somalia. There was a good supply of food, and there were a number of humanitarian organizations on hand ready to distribute food and to dispense medicine and to render medical aid to these needy people. The real cause for the awful misery of these people, anybody remember? It had to do with there was no longer a stable government in place to establish and to maintain order in the land. Warlords, warlords fought amongst themselves and used terrorist tactics to block shipments of food and medical supplies in all parts of Somalia. The warring factions within the country were responsible for the terrible conditions under which the people existed. And they oftentimes took and captured all those medical supplies and food supplies and kept them for themselves or turned around and sold them on the black market. The plight of these people in Somalia became an item for consideration by the United Nations. In December 1992, just two weeks before Christmas, troops from the United States were sent to this ravaged land in an operation called <clears throat> Restore Hope. <clears throat> One of their first assignments was to do what needed to be done to restore order in the land in order that humanitarian efforts could proceed without interference on the part of the hostile factions. The epistle of James in the opening verses of chapter 4 calls our attention to a similar situation in the realm of our personal life as we endeavor to, quote, live the good life, right? We hear that. 
Our lives are often miserable and in disarray because of warring factions with our own hearts. The good news which James brings here is that there is hope for us. And there are resources at hand which, if we will use them, can bring order and direction into our lives so that we can have peace of mind and heart and, above all, live productive, God-pleasing lives. So here we're going to take a look at, we're going to be chapter 4. We're going to just take the first three verses, which I call conformity to the world is futile and can be fatal. And that's what James is going to talk about here. Okay, just the first three verses. Would someone care to read the first three verses for us? What quarrel, what causes quarrels and what causes fights amongst you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have so, you murder, you covet. Uh, and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. I ask you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Okay. Thank you, Gretchen. When someone has an out of control mouth, right? That's what we talked about in chapter three. You can trace the problem back to a heart that has no peace or contentment and to a mind that is full of bitterness and selfishness. It is the same with people who fight and quarrel. And apparently James had been hearing that such things were going on in some of the congregations of the scattered brothers and sisters. This is outrageous because such behavior has no place in Christian congregations in Christian families, or in Christian hearts. You trace these evil deeds back to the source and you will find coveting, evil desires, and hatred, which James, like John, in 1 John 3, 15, says it's the equivalent of murder. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. A selfish and covetous mind also ruins prayer. We're going to talk about that a little bit later as we get into this. In the closing verse of chapter 3, James emphasizes the important principle that it is only in a climate of peace that the fruits of righteousness can flourish. That was the first, first uh, slide I had up on the screen here this morning. In this section, he deals with the harsh reality that not peace, but rather conflict and strife are the order of the day for his readers. And that's what he wants to deal with. And in a loving and pastoral manner, James endeavors to lead his, quote, parishioners to understand why it is this way and to enable them to deal with the problem in a constructive manner. Now, judging by the word which James use, uses here to describe the situation, it must have been pretty bad. The Greek word, and your translations probably have different things. Some have wars or quarrels. It describes, the Greek word there describes a full-blown military campaign. The word for fighting suggests intense hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it's a pretty strong word that he's using here, and that's what I want to draw out for you. They were really, really going at it. And what they were fighting about, James doesn't say. Now, in his dictionary of the New Testament Greek, Dr. Thayer, makes the observation in connection with this word, which we translate as wars or quarrels, that the strife and the contention going on was very likely tied in with, quote, his words, the legal suits in behalf of those contending at law for property and privilege. In other words, they were fighting it out in the courts. Maybe so. We don't know. 
All we have to do is read the newspapers and know how distressing this whole thing can be. The news currently reports the bitterness and the hatred being manifested in the custody proceedings involving a famous actress and her superstar husband. Some of us may have personally experienced such an ordeal ourselves. We know how hostilities can escalate until they become a consuming passion on the part of all concerned. And Gretchen, I noticed your translation used that word passion. I'm going to come to that in just a moment. Whatever the specific problem or issue, the unpleasant reality here, which the first readers of James faced on a daily basis, caused friction and hostility, which shut out any sense of happiness and joy for them. In other words, they were fighting amongst themselves. And James doesn't waste any time in getting to the heart of the matter. <clears throat> in fact, he says what? It's a matter of the heart, the heart of all those involved. The outward conflicts between people are the direct result of a war going on in the hearts and minds of individuals. James couldn't say it any plainer as he does in verse 1. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Now, we've oftentimes heard the expression, hurt people hurt people, right? We've heard that. The Greek word, which is translated as passions, and Gretchen, you must be using the ESV, I'm guessing, because that's what the ESV uses. The NIV uses desires. So if you have the NIV, the Greek word, which is translated desires or passions here, is embodied in our word hedonism. Okay, so what, what's hedonism, right? This is a word we use today to describe a philosophy of life which makes selfish, sensual pleasure the focus, focus and the goal of life. Do we have any problem with hedonism today, anybody? It's pretty bad. Right? Everything revolves around sensual pleasure. And all you do is turn your TV on to see that. This surely must ring a bell with us. We live in a time when we have greater access to those things which promise to bring pleasure into our lives. And we are constantly bombarded with cleverly conceived and designed appeals to our basic human nature. Madison Avenue, I think, understands human nature better than most theologians. They know how to appeal to it, right? Which boldly claim that they will bring true happiness and satisfaction just by our product, right? Or use this product or whatever. Verse 2 delineates how this drive within us, within us, precludes peaceful relationships with others. What's it lead to? Hostility. Leads to hostility. When you have a burning desire for something, an obsession, you will stop at nothing in order to fulfill it. If it means destroying other people in the process, so be it. This is the force behind that word kill in the NIV. I think Gretchen in the ESV, it's murder, right? In that verse, verse two, it's in verse two. First, there is an attitude of hatred towards the person who stands in the way of you attaining your selfish goals. Hate implies placing no value on the person towards whom you feel hatred. No wonder Jesus put hatred and murder on the same level in the eyes of God. That's in Matthew 5, 21-22. Scripture reminds us graphically that 
this isn't as far-fetched an idea as it might seem to be. Okay, it was misguided desire and passion. Can you think of any examples from scripture where there was misguided passion and desire? Anyone? King David. Thank you, Gretchen. There you go. 2 Samuel 11, King David. King David, it was passion and desire on his part, Israel's King David, which led him to kill Uriah. And who was Uriah? Her, her husband. It was Bathsheba's husband. Yeah. Bathsheba's husband. And he went to all kinds of means, right? To try to accomplish his goal. <clears throat> it, it's really interesting in the story there in 2 Samuel 11, King David brought Uriah back. They were off fighting a battle. And he brought him back, hoping that he would sleep with his wife to cover up King David's tracks. Anybody recall what happened? Uriah did not sleep with his wife. In fact, he didn't sleep at all. He stood in the doorway of his house on guard. And that's generally what, what a soldier did when he came back. If he wasn't fighting in the battle, he was brought up the battlefield in, in conjunction with his fellow soldiers. He stood in the doorway. He wasn't going to what? Take advantage of the leisure of being at home and being with his wife. And so he, out of dedication to King David and to the fellow soldiers, did what? Stood guard in his doorway. David went nuts. That didn't work. So then David ends up ultimately having Uriah killed. How did he do that? Anybody recall? He took Uriah back to the battle. This time he stuck him where? In the front line. That was guaranteed death. You fought the front line, you were generally the ones who got killed first. And finally he ended up getting killed. David went, I did it. I did it. The other one, the other story, I guess exhibit B here, is wicked King Ahab and his wonderful little wife, Jezebel. How many of you have named your daughters Jezebel? <laughs> that name does not have a good connotation. There's a reason. Ahab and Jezebel desired Naboth's vineyard, which was next door to them, to their, to their palace. And it was a beautiful, beautiful vineyard. And so what they do, they arranged to have Naboth stoned to death so that they could take, his, take over his vineyard. That's in 1 Kings 21. And it's first 14 verse if you read the story. Interesting story. God, by the way, has a final word. And uh, things don't go well for King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, you may recall. I won't go into the gory details. I'll let you find that out on your own. When James writes here, you do not have because you do not ask God. In verse 2, he's take, he takes a small leap from the things people think they have to have in order to be satisfied to the effect that they hope to realize, namely, satisfaction. Isn't it amazing how we think we can, we got to have certain things in order to be satisfied? I don't know about you, this week I've been... <clears throat> I've had to fill up my car a couple times. <laughs> and I saw a cartoon earlier this week. I tried to find it this morning. I wanted to put it up on the screen. I absolutely love this cartoon. I, I'm trying to remember. I think it was a female cartoonist who drew it. But she had, it showed two gas pumps. And this guy pulls up and he's standing there with this bewildered look on his face because there was a desk in between him with a lady who had financing on the desk. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that's exactly how I feel when I go to fill up a car. Yeah. You have to take out a small bank loan. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's almost as if James is saying here, if you really want satisfaction, 
You need to be in touch with God through prayer. He will set you straight and he will get you on the right track. So instead of fighting, you should take time to pray. That's what he's saying. For those who, who may have taken the time to pray, James adds the explanation that if their prayers weren't answered, maybe they needed to check their prayers. I don't know how many times I've heard that as a pastor in my ministry. People coming up to me and said, Pastor, people, uh, they come up to me and say, God won't answer my prayers. God won't answer my prayers. Is that true? Does God not answer prayer? Is there ever a prayer that goes unanswered? We just don't like the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gretchen. They didn't like the answer. God answers in one of three ways, right? Yes, no, and three, you got to be kidding. <laughs> or maybe, maybe. But so oftentimes people come to me and they say, well, God didn't answer my prayers. I'm going, well, yeah, he did. You just don't like the answer. Kind of what Gretchen said. Notice James in verse three, when you ask, you do not receive. Why? Because you what? Ask with the wrong, wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So oftentimes when people ask things from God, it's for selfish reasons, right? Selfish farmer Brown. He prayed for himself, his wife, his two sons, those four, no more. In other words, he was only concerned about himself and about their own pleasure. Um, he warns here, James warns here against using the high privilege of prayer as a means in order to satisfy your earthly selfish in interests and desires. James implies that when you speak with God in prayer, it isn't your place to tell God what you want him to do for you. God is not Santa Claus, nor is he your divine flunky. You need to bring your desires to God, run them by him to see what he thinks about them, and then be ready to revise your requests. Give them a chance to speak to you and instruct you. And God does that. The problem is people don't listen. God answers prayer. You ever notice you're praying for something and it doesn't happen, so you just keep on praying, keep on praying. Well, ultimately, over time, if you're open to what God is trying to do, he's going to end up taking you from here over to here where you should have been in the first place to begin with. This is appropriate praying and it offers the promises of true and lasting satisfaction. Anything less will be a waste of time. So James is saying, don't go fighting with one another over your desires and things. Take them to God in prayer. See what he says. Maybe he wants you to have it, maybe he doesn't. And so that's what he's trying to get at here for that. Any questions on the first three verses? Any comments that you have about the text? Okay. If not, let's go on to the next two verses. We're going to look at verses 4 and 5. Would somebody care to read those? You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with this world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. And if your aim is to enjoy this world, you can't be a friend of God. Don't you think the scriptures mean when they say the Holy, that the Holy Spirit, whom God has placed within us, jealously longs for us to be faithful? Mike, what translation are you using? You know, this is the living, living translation. I'm sorry, the what? True living. True living? Uh, oh, new living. Oh, it's the life application. Yeah, New Living Translation. Oh, the NLT. The NLT. Yeah, the New Living Translation. Okay. 
I actually, I actually like that one. There's, there's a number of places in there. I don't care for how they translate, but there's a number of other places I think they do a great job of trans <coughs> translating. It's a fairly easy text to read and understand. Um, it's the one that we purchased that we used for the youth, that we were using for a youth Bible study here as well. The reason I asked that, because he said, what, you adulterers, right? And I'm going to come to that in just a moment. In the previous verse, James asks his beloved brothers and sisters to use their minds to think seriously about the source of their problems. In verses 4 and 5 here, he adds the dimension here of emotion. And he does this by evoking a picture of God's relationship to his people, which was quite familiar to the people who knew the Old Testament. In other words, God often lamented the way faithless Israel despised his love and chased after, <clears throat> chased after the Canaanite gods Baal and Asherah. Okay? Baal and Asherah. God often compared this relationship to that of a husband and wife. And I've got a number of Old Testament passages. If you're interested, you want to look it up. So James get very personal here with them. They were supposed to worship and follow God, but instead they chased after their what? Baal and Asherah. They turned around and built temples to them. These were the gods of fertility in Canaanite religion. And so it's kind of what they did. If we back up for just a moment, when God took Israel into the promised land, what was his instructions to them? Anybody recall? Simply put, clear out the land. In other words, go out and go in there and kill them all. Because they were so evil and wicked and corrupt. And God was concerned that when the children of Israel got in there, if any of them remained behind, what was going to happen? They would adopt and become corrupt and wicked, just like the Canaanites. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. <clears throat> they went in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. My allergies are terrible. Um, he, they went in there and, and struck down most of them, Canaanites, but they left a fair amount of them. And so then they started living amongst them. And all of a sudden, a drought comes this year and the, maybe the next year. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, they're going, wait a minute. And they turn to their Canaanite neighbors. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Hope I get this cleared up for worship. Um, but anyway, they went to their Canaanite neighbors and said, what do you guys do when this happens? They turn around and say, well, we offer up sacrifices to our gods, Baal and Asherah. And so the Israelites turned around and said, okay, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And that's exactly what they did. And they started worshiping Baal and Asherah and rejected God. And that's why if you look, God always refers to his relationship with Israel as a husband and wife. By the way, it's the same way in the New Covenant, right? Christ is the bridegroom. The church is his bride. It's a marital relationship. Why? Because God knows that the highest relationship on this earth is that between husband and wife. Now, I am a son. I'm a nephew. I'm a cousin. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I have multiple relationships in my life. The highest relationship I have is the husband of Kim. That is the highest relationship. I always stress this to couples when they're getting married in premarital counseling. I said, you have been, you know, a son or a daughter, or, you know, grandson, granddaughter, whatever. But when you enter into this relationship, you now enter into the highest relationship that God has established on this earth. Because husband and wife share a relationship that 
is not found in any other relationship. I am closer to Kim. She knows more about me than my own mother. And that's a special relationship. That's why Jesus says, let man not put asunder. In other words, don't let anything come between that relationship. God took, turned around, was looking for an image that he can describe his relationship to us. So what's he do? He goes and finds the highest relationship we have on this earth. Husband and wife. God says, I'm your husband. You're the wife. I'm the bridegroom. You're the bride. But what happened? Israel, instead of maintaining that relationship and worshiping the Lord God of Israel, turned around what? When went and had an adulterous relationship with Baal and Asherah. Okay? That's why God accuses them of spiritual adultery. And that's why James, as he uses the term here, Mike, and I found it interesting when you were reading it, he, he literally comes out and says adulterers. Doesn't he? What's the NIV say? I think it's the same as the ESV. You adulterous people. That's not quite as strong. You know, what's interesting, the King James Version, I think, is closer here to the original text when it translates the beginning of verse 4, he says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. That's pretty strong. James wants them to see and feel the seriousness of their present lifestyle. It doesn't only cause their lives to be filled with strife and unrest, it affects their relationship with God. And that's what he wants them to see. They break the bond between themselves and their God and they become guilty of spiritual unfaithfulness, spiritual adultery. So when you look at the Old Testament, you see Israel doing what it's doing. Don't go like this and go shame on you. Right? Because as you're pointing the finger at them, you got how many fingers pointing back at you? Three. Right? In other words, we're equally just as guilty. And that's what James here is trying to point out. When James uses the term here, world, the Greek word here is cosmos. Sound familiar? Cosmos. Cosmos. He obviously has in mind everything, and that's what this word means, everything that is evil and opposed to God on this earth. So when the Greek word cosmos appears, it's not just talking about world in a general sense. It's talking about everything that is evil and opposed to God in this world. However, he includes things which in themselves may not be evil, such as pleasures, which when misused can entice a person away from God. When our minds are set upon the things of this world and given more value than our relationship to God, then our lives become an exercise in hostility to God. I heard a Lutheran pastor, an older Lutheran pastor one time say, he said, one of the easiest ways for us to show our hostility towards God is the breaking the third commandment. When you choose to go out on the golf course or to sit at home and leisurely, you know, in your pajamas, read the paper and eat your little brunch, you're showing your hostility to God. That's when you're misusing pleasures in, in a very hostile way. Um, when, when our minds are set upon the things of this world and given more value than our relationship to God, our lives become an exercise in hostility to God. And here, James sounds a lot like his half-brother Jesus when Jesus said this whoops, in Matthew 6, 24, it's first part of that verse, no man can serve two masters. The Apostle John underlined the same thought when he said this in 1 John 2, 15, 
second half of that verse, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is what? It's not in him. You have to make a choice about your loyalties. There is no in-between stance for a human being to take. Friendship with the world <clears throat> equals enmity with God. I'll give you an example. We had a family at my last church. They came, they bought a ranch prop. It was kind of a ranch property. It had barns and, and fences and all that. It was up in the upper hills right before the Rockies, Rocky Mountains. Um, we were at 5,000 and some, what was it, 5,400 elevation maybe, I think in Fort Collins, where they were at like 7,900. So they were a couple thousand feet up. And when they first got into town, they'd been in the town actually for quite a while. And they took and came to our church one Sunday, came to me after the service, said, Pastor, we're LCMS, we just moved into the area, we want to join your church. I said, okay. Um, so we turned around and we set off for a transfer for them. The transfer came through. That was, by the way, the first and only time we ever saw them. <laughs> the next Sunday rolled around, they weren't there. The next Sunday rolled around, they weren't there. Weeks went by, months started going by, and I called them and I left messages and said, hey, your transfer came through. In fact, the Sunday that we brought new members in, they weren't there. And I, I got concerned about them, obviously so, right? So I drove up there, found out they were home, drove up there and made a surprise visit on them because I could never get them to return my phone call. <clears throat> and I'd say, this is Pastor, please call me. And I'd list all my phone numbers. So I drove up there and caught them. They were a little surprised to see me. And I walked up to them and started talking with them and said, guys, I've missed you, is everything okay? Well, Pastor, we're busy. Okay, <laughs> so am I, I got that. But why you're not on church on Sunday mornings. Well, they raised horses and they used them for the, the horse, uh, the trials they do when they get the barrel, the barrel racing and, and all that kind of stuff. So they were going around every weekend to all these tournaments and everything all over the place. And they were throwing anything that had anything to do with a horse in the mix. They said, we can't come because we're too busy with our horses. And I looked at him and I said, guys, your horses are your God. You know about God, but you don't know him. Your horses are your God. And I said, Luther says that which we look to as the highest good in our life becomes our false God. And I said, I'm just, as your pastor, I want you to know you have allowed these horses to become your God. I'm glad you raise horses, you're very good at it, but not when those horses get to the point where they interrupt your relationship with your Lord and Savior. I said, when the horses come before God does, you have, and I, I went back to this in, in James here, James four. I said, you now have, you, God is no longer in your heart. You're, you're allowing these horses to take over and they become your God. Well, that might be, but we love our horses. That was their answer to me. So I ended up going back. I called their pastor, the one who transferred the, the membership thing to me. I probably should have called them from the get-go, but they seemed like a nice family. It was just a husband, a wife, and a daughter. They had a teenage daughter. And I called them, and I you know, asked him about their membership there, and he said, well, <laughs> and he went on to tell me exactly what we we're experiencing. And he said, and I worked and worked with them trying to get them to do it. He said, the only reason they transferred is because I knew they had moved and I looked it up in the Lutheran <laughs> annual. You guys were the closest to them. So I contacted them and said, here's 
St. John's Lutheran Church, you need to go down there and worship. I said, well, they showed up one Sunday and told me they wanted their membership transferred. He goes, I'm so sorry. He said, that was just because I was putting pressure on him. So this is kind of what James is getting at here, guys. He's saying friendship with the world equals enmity toward God. And they did not seem to care a whole lot about their relationship with God. In verse 5, the readers are reminded of an Old Testament truth that they were apparently overlooking or forgetting. James says, or do you think Scripture says without reason? James indicates there is a natural tendency for people to not take seriously the words which God speaks through the Holy Scriptures. And this may be a problem for God's people in our day as well. And I think it is. That's why you've heard me say how many times in the last, what, going on 10 years here, take yourself lightly, take God seriously. Because people completely what? And I see many Christians doing this. They flip it. They reverse it. They take themselves way too seriously. And they take God way, way too lightly. And that's what James is trying to, trying to get at here. The truth referred to in this verse is a profound one. Some scholars have written that this verse is the most difficult one in the Bible. It's actually in the original Greek, for the most part, it's almost set up as two questions. Now, I don't know if your Bible has set up that way. I don't think so. Part of the problem comes from the structure of the sentence in Greek, which allows for options in deciding who or what is to be the subject of the verb. Furthermore, there is no passage from which this is a verbatim quote. In other words, it's not like he's turned around and quoting from the Old Testament. The reference to jealousy leads us to a passage or two, I think, in Exodus. And I'm going to put those up here for you. In Exodus 20, verse 5, at the conclusion of God's presenting the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel, God says this, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Sound familiar? Those of you who went through confirmation class, it's the closing of the commandments. Right? Conclusion of the commandments. <clears throat> I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. A few chapters later, Exodus 34, verse 14, this thought is taken one step further when God tells his people, do not worship any other God, for the Lord, notice how Lord is written, whose name is Jealous, <clears throat> is a jealous God. Okay? Now, why do I say that? Look at Lord. And unfortunately, I think in the in the PowerPoint, you can't use small caps. It only does small caps. But in the original text, if you look at your Bibles, in that particular verse, Exodus 34, verse 14, Lord is in small caps, which means what? This is God's covenant name. This is God's name of grace his covenant of grace with his people. And he says his name is Jealous. He is a jealous God. What does that mean? Does that mean God's being petty? No. Does anybody know? How would you describe that to somebody? God says his name is Jealous. He's a jealous God. What does that mean? Anybody? He wants you for himself. Thank you. Good, Margie. Yeah. He wants you for himself. There are no other gods. And God will not tolerate your loyalty to Baal or Asherah or any other god for that matter. Horses. You pick the god, a false god. God says, I'm not going to share my glory, my honor, my love with any other false god. I'm a jealous god. It only belongs to me. I'm the only true real god there is. And that is an important part of a statement of faith. And that's what he's trying to get at. Taking a cue from these passages, many translators follow the ideas, the idea set forth here in verse 5. And the EHV, which is the Evangelical Heritage Version, 
We used to have a couple of the Bibles back there. I noticed they're missing. They grew legs and walked off. That's pretty bad when you got to steal Bibles from the church. Maybe they just got misplaced somewhere. Maybe they're around here. I haven't found them. I've been looking for them. Because we bought a couple of copies of it. The EHV, by the way, is a great translation. It's the one that we use in service and worship. If you're wondering what translation is this, it's the EHV. It's called the Evangelical Heritage Version. It was put together recently by a, a load of Lutheran theologians and scholars. And going back to the original Greek and the Hebrew, they did an excellent job of translating it. And they put it in such a way that it reads a lot smoother than what the ESV, the English Standard Version, does. In fact, I use the EHV quite a bit. I've started using it fairly often. But anyway, in the EHV it says that the spirit who lives in us yearns jealousy, jealously. James' point here is clear. The relationship-wrecking poison of envy is a fruit not of the spirit, but of Satan. So if you're envious, that's not coming from God. That's not coming from the Holy Spirit. That's coming from Satan. Through holy baptism and our faith, God has an investment of love in each one of us. We become a part of him as husband and wives are united in a true marriage. We are as close to him as children are to their parents. And God wants to keep it that way. He truly cares. He doesn't want to lose us. What a neat thought that is for us. God really cares about little old me, right? Little old me. What a mark, what a motivation that is for us to care how we behave and conduct ourselves. But there's another profound truth that we don't want to pass by here. <clears throat> God's a personal being. <laughs> our relationship is to is not excuse me is not to an impersonal set of rules and regulations it is a relationship to a person capital P when we violate that relationship the very heart and soul of God are violated it isn't just a commandment that is broken it is a relationship that is damaged. God cares and he doesn't want that to happen for our sake as well as his, okay? And you know, how many people, tell me about it, how do you see God? Do you see him as a personal being or do you see him as a set of rules and regulations? It's amazing talking to people how often I hear that latter. God's a set of rules and regulations. You know, I'll ask people, tell me about your relationship with God. <clears throat> and what do they do? They go into the rules and the regulations. And I'm going, no, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about rules and regulations. I'm talking about your relationship with God. He is a personal being. And he loves us. And he wants to have that close relationship with each one of us. Just like you, just like Bella and Sebastian have a relationship, just like Bella has a relationship with Judy, her mother. He wants that close, intimate relationship. No wonder people don't talk to God very often in prayer. If God's nothing more than just a set of rules and regulations, who wants to talk to that? Come to him and talk to him as your father. Imagine, I would tell people this, imagine... When, when I would come home, when my kids were little, and I would come home, one of the first things, you know, after I did things around the house, whatever, eventually I'd end up in a chair or on the sofa or something. One, one of the kids, or all three of the kids, would come bouncing over and jump up in my lap. Daddy, let me tell you what happened today. You know, it was awesome. I loved it. I said, tell me, what happened? What happened at school? And they would go off on this, you know, narrative of all things that happened. Did I sit there and yawn and try to watch the TV in the background? No. 
Those kids had my undivided attention. Imagine when you come to God in prayer, when you come to Him, imagine you're like those little kids bouncing up to Him and sitting in His lap, talking to Him, telling Him. God is interested in what goes on in your life. He's interested in what's important to you. When I was at College Station, we had a thing um, it had been done by the pastor prior to me, and I thought it was a great thing, so I kept doing it. We would come to the time of prayers, and right before I'd go into the prayers, I would come down out of the chancel area with a with a clipboard and a piece of paper and a pen, and I'd say, anybody have any special prayers today? You know, that you didn't have the opportunity to call them into the church prior to this morning. And sometimes they had prayer requests, sometimes they didn't. A lot of times they did and said, okay, let's go into the prayers. Sometimes they did. I'll never forget one particular Sunday, one little girl sitting with her mom, and it was a single parent mom, and there were two little girls. She had two little girls, and they were sitting on the front. This little girl was the oldest of the two girls, and I want to say she was probably maybe third grade, second, third grade. And she raised her hand, so I called her. She said, Pastor, we lost our dog this week. He got out of the backyard and ran off mm -hmm. two days ago. We haven't been able to find him. Can you pray for, I don't remember what the dog's name was, Bingo or something like that. You know, can you pray for Bingo? I said, yes. So I wrote it down, got up to the prayers, came to the special time we include extra prayers. I prayed for Bingo. I prayed for the family. I prayed for that little girl. I prayed for God. If Bingo is fine, Bingo is still there. Help this family, Lord, to find Bingo. They did, by the way, by Tuesday. They didn't find him on Monday. They found him on Tuesday. Somebody contacted them, said, I was just talking with, it was in the neighborhood. The dog had wandered off quite a ways. It was a big neighborhood. And they said, somebody told me they thought maybe this was your dog. Are you missing your dog? And they said, yeah. Bingo came home. Here's the point. After service, that Sunday, I had several people, not one, not two, three people, three different people come up to me and chew me out because I prayed for Bingo. They said, Pastor, that was really stupid on your part. God has a lot more important things to do than worry about a missing dog. And they, they chewed me up one side and down the other and spit me out and chewed on me some more because I was wasting their time praying about a dog in service. And here was my response back to them. I said, if that dog is important to that little girl, that dog is important to God. Because that little girl is God's baptized daughter. And I said, just like your children, if they have a problem, they're needing something, are you as a parent going to be concerned about that? Yes, you are. God is concerned about a missing dog. And I said, that was the best thing I could have done. That was a witness to that little girl. That even though she has a missing dog or anything else going on in her life, she can what? She can turn to God and take it to him. And he cares. And that went a long ways. That little girl was so thankful that I prayed for that dog, especially when the dog showed up two days later on Tuesday. Because God had answered her prayer. And she had to call me and tell me. And her mom was standing in the background. She handed the phone to him. The little girl called me. I said, Pastor, her bingo came home. And she was so excited. I said, isn't that wonderful? I said, God heard her, heard her prayer. And he answered it, being was home safe. Then the mother came on and she thanked me again. She said, Pastor, thanks for praying on Sunday. I said, you're welcome. But you know what? People misunderstand. This is what James is trying to get at here. There's nothing that's too important we can't take to God in prayer. God is a personal being, guys. He's not a set of rules and regulations. All right. The next section we're going to go into, I think it's time. What time is it? Yeah, it's 925. It's probably a good time to stop here. We're going to go to the next part because I got a number of things here.
I got seven things I want to put before you uh, for sure next week. But we're going to get in the next section, verses 6 through 10. Okay? Anybody have thoughts, comments, questions about anything that we've talked about here today? Or anything that you don't understand yet from the text? James is such a great book. Okay. If not, just question, it. Yeah, just a question about my translation. Because it's a little bit confusing to understand the KJV sometimes. Oh, you guess the KJV? Yes, they are. Okay. And so in James 5, he says, Do ye think that the scriptures say, safe in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Yeah. That's saying the same thing as what I read from the NIV, but it's just... It's a little bit harder to understand than the King James Version. In other words, he's he's saying, you know what the scriptures say. You know, you think it's saying it in vain. In other words, you think it's just saying it for no reason at all. Does the spirit lust after jealousy? And the answer is no. But God is a jealous God. But he doesn't, the Holy Spirit's not the one who brings about jealousy. That's Satan, not God. Yeah, jealousy or envy. Yeah, it's hard to understand it, the King James Version. When I used to teach confirmation class, so many of the kids showed up. This has been years ago. They had their parents' and grandparents' Bible. And guess what it was? King James Version. <laughs> KJV. And, you know, we go through, as Bella knows, we go through and we read the verses. And so many of them would read out of the King James Version, you know, he and doth, doth us, saith, you know, and all that. And they'd, they'd read through it, stumble through it, and then they'd get done, they go, Pastor, what on earth did I just read? What does that say? And I'd spend so much of the time in the class just trying to translate it for them that I finally, the next year, I said, okay, no more King James Version Bibles. We're going to sit with NIV <laughs> or the ESV or NLT or something like that. So it's a little bit easier to understand. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough, that's a difficult verse. You know, like I said, verse 5 is probably the most difficult one in the Bible to translate. And there is some differences of opinion on as to what exactly James is saying there. But I just kind of covered both sides of it because it comes down to basically two things. So, anybody else? You can still read the King James Version. That's okay. okay. <laughs> All right, let's close in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of prayer. And Lord, you are a personal being. You're not just a set of rules and regulations. You are a divine spirit and a being who loves us. And through the waters of holy baptism, you have washed us and cleansed us from our sins. You have literally come and now dwell within our hearts. And we thank you for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, forgive us for the times that we war amongst ourselves in factions over the different desires of our hearts because we enviously and jealously want this or that, but rather to come to you to be content and to come to you in prayer and to lay whatever requests, Lord, that we have before you, knowing that you will answer those requests in the way that you see best and best fit for all of us. You love us and you're always gonna do what's best for us. We thank you, Lord, for this time, this day in your word. Thank you for helping us to work our way through these, some of these difficult passages and be with us as we continue in our learning and understanding of what James is trying to tell us. Most importantly, help us not just to be hearers only, but doers of the word. For the sake of Jesus and his kingdom, we pray this. Amen. God be with you all, and we'll see you shortly.